I am, and probably have, have remained for most of my life, more of an artisan than a scientist. And I became a fairly good artisan in terms of being able to do the skills needed to do the biochemistry, chemistry, physical chemistry of that day and age. I guess it comes back to the fact that I was able to take things apart and put them back together again. In 1939, we traveled to Switzerland and uh, we were in Zurich when the war broke out. And uh, my father rushed back home and he stayed in Thailand uh, during the war. It was a bit complicated, of course, because my mother um, had, uh, who is a beautiful, was a beautiful uh, blonde, blue-eyed uh, Aryan uh, type, was of course invited to the 1936 Olympics to go back from Thailand to Berlin and refused to do that, which got the attention of the Gestapo. And uh, so um, my mother was sort of persona non grata and um, finally her citizenship was taken away and so she was uh, without any passport uh, in, in Switzerland during the war and uh, that uh, sort of um, limited her very much in terms of any employment or anything like that. So she uh, moved together with me into a, uh, what was called a children's home in Kinderheim but which by that time had been taken over by the Red Cross and uh, was uh, hosting about uh, 90, 95 children who had been um, rescued by the Red Cross from the um, extermination camps. That was essentially the place where we lived for the duration of the war. The uh, Kinderheim was in a, uh, a place that is famous for being beautiful, namely Ascona on the Lago Maggiore. So it was actually uh, not a bad childhood. But, uh, I can't say that my mother was ever uh, very, very much uh, uh, involved because she was so, so uh, um, tired uh, with all the work that she was doing in the children's home. My mother, um, in a way, sort of um, expiated her association with being German and uh, the uh, turn that uh, Germany was taking by uh, just uh, totally overworking and uh, that was her way of dealing with it. In Switzerland, you're always a foreigner. You're always an Auslander. And when you come to the States, that gradually washes away. I don't think you can define a point where it washes away, but it does disappear so that by the time um, you get on, uh, the, you, you know, your accent only becomes a quaint part of you uh, rather than a, uh, something to judge you on. Al Stetson was one of the first uh, postdocs that uh, worked with Michael McCarty. I think he called up uh, the secretary and said, uh, I, I have somebody here you want to meet. <laughs> uh, that's about it. And she asked him what the name was and uh, uh, he, try, he uh, try, made an attempt to pronounce my name and then, and then it says, just, 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 just says Stetson. Mac was a very warm, gentle person, um, but you could irritate him if you, uh, if you really tried. 
only, it's only after about five or six years that you earn the right to call him Mac. <laughs> now everybody else who wasn't in his lab called him Mac right away. So there was a clear distinction between uh, the people in the lab and the people outside the lab. So the, uh, some efforts were made uh, by uh, a number of people and including Mac to find a, uh, a position uh, where I could uh, use my scientific background. I joined the uh, laboratory that was particularly interested in uh, meningitis because that was turning out to be a serious problem in the armed forces. So I started with the fact that the obvious thing, if you're going to deal with, uh, from a chemical point of view, of what, how you're going to deal with this disease, you have to know there's something about the cell wall and the capsules of the meningococcus. So, what do I know how to do? I know how to do polysaccharide chemistry. And it turns out that the meningococci have, according to the literature, some interesting polysaccharides that might be useful as vaccines. And I started working on the chemistry of those because the pneumococcal polysaccharides had been used as a vaccine in a trial in 1945. There was a clear precedent that a polysaccharide vaccine, two capsules, could be prevented. So obviously, <clears throat> it deserved to be looked at. I was prescient enough at that time to be uh, to spend essentially equal time on the group A vaccine, a group A polysaccharide, although it was not a problem at all in the army. And the reason for that is that the, the, the group A is the real problem in, uh, in, in the world, particularly at that time in Africa, and then subsequently in Brazil, in Finland, uh, in Mongolia, huge group A epidemics in China. Uh, you know, that, that was the organism that was really uh, the, the one to work on. And so uh, I, did, I uh, kept an eye on it, and, and, and we got the chemistry of it done. And uh, pretty soon, I had uh, some of the group A and the group C polysaccharide in hand. And it became clear that from a point of view of, because I was beginning to think of uh, how to use this for possible vaccines, that they were not going to work out as vaccines. And in fact, that had been tried in the 1940s by a uh, person at Columbia called Elvin Cabot. And, um, Actually, I called him up on the telephone once and asked him what he thought of the idea of using these polysaccharides for um, immunizing agents. And he said, well, you know, I'm still looking at, uh, I'm looking at the scars on my arm. Uh, tell me exactly which polysaccharides you're going to use. <laughs> the immunogenicity of polysaccharides was dependent on their molecular size had been determined by people like Cabot and others as well. So you have to find a way to isolate them in high molecular weight form. So what happened then is that uh, I started making quite a few of these uh, preparations in increasing amounts in my lab and uh, decided that uh, you know, I should start testing its immunogenicity in animals. And you know, I injected mice, I injected guinea pigs, I injected things that were available at Walter Reed and uh, they failed to respond. The matter came to an impasse because I just couldn't uh, get anything done. The animals just wouldn't respond to it. So I decided uh, to, uh, on uh, sometime, and the, the dates are actually in the, in the original paper, to inject myself. And uh, lo and behold, I responded very well. And uh, then, uh, you know, I, we, we, we went and confessed to the director of the institute what I had done. And uh, he, uh, he said, well, all right, you, uh, you have to now repeat that in, a, in, our, in our clinical grade facility. I think an additional five volunteers were done around uh, April. And then I worked very hard 
to get a trial done, uh, to get the vaccine accepted uh, on the protocol uh, for recruits. My role in this was primarily to develop the vaccine both as a material and as a set of standards. There is no good animal model for meningococcal disease. So you can't test the vaccine for its effectiveness in an animal model. Nobody's succeeded in doing that and uh, this, it's certainly been tried. So you are unfortunately then have to rely on something else and that's the standards and that's what got through the FDA at that time. The whole idea of being able to, to look at an organism and say, I know how I can hit you in a chemical sense, in a real chemical sense that is based on biology, is, is, is at least the basis of the polysaccharide vaccines. Chemistry is important. <laughs>